Peter Yearsley. The People of the Abyss by Jack London. Chapter 4. A Man and the Abyss. I say, can you let a lodging? These words I discharged carelessly over my shoulder, at a stout and elderly woman of whose fare I was partaking in a greasy coffee-house, down near the pool, and not very far from Limehouse. Oh, yes, she answered shortly, my appearance possibly not approximating the standard of affluence required by her house. I said no more consuming my rasher of bacon and pint of sickly tea in silence. Nor did she take further interest in me till I came to pay my reckoning, fourpence, when I pulled all of ten shillings out of my pocket. The expected result was produced. Yes, sir, she at once volunteered. I have nice lodgings you'd likely tuck a fancy to. Back from a voyage, sir. How much for a room? I inquired, ignoring her curiosity. She looked me up and down with frank surprise. I don't let rooms, not to my regular lodgers, much less casuals. Then I'll have to look along a bit, I said, with marked disappointment. But the sight of my ten shillings had made her keen. I can let you have a nice bed in with two other men, she urged. Good, respectable men, and steady. But I don't want to sleep with two other men, I objected. You don't have to. There's three beds in the room. "'And it's not a very small room.' "'How much?' I demanded. "'Half a crown a week, two and six, to a regular lodger. "'You'll fancy the men, I'm sure. "'One works in the warehouse, and he's been with me two years now. "'And the other's been with me six, six years, sir, "'and two months, coming next Saturday. "'He's a scene-shifter,' she went on. "'A steady, respectable man, never missing a night's work in the time he's been with me. "'And he likes the house.' He says as it's the best he can do in the way of lodgings. I board him, and the other lodgers too. I suppose he's saving money right along, I insinuated innocently. Bless you, no, nor can he do as well elsewhere with his money. And I thought of my own spacious west, with room under its sky and unlimited air for a thousand Londons. And here was this man, a steady and reliable man, never missing a night's work frugal and honest, lodging in one room with two other men, paying two dollars and a half per month for it, and out of his experience, adjudging it to be the best he could do. And here was I, on the strength of the ten shillings in my pocket, able to enter in with my rags and take up my bed with him. The human soul is a lonely thing, but it must be very lonely sometimes when there are three beds to a room and casuals with ten shillings are admitted. "'How long have you been here?' I asked. Thirteen years, sir. And don't you think you'll fancy the lodging?' The while she talked, she was shuffling ponderously about the small kitchen, in which she cooked the food for her lodgers, who were also boarders. When I first entered, she had been hard at work, nor had she let up once throughout the conversation. Undoubtedly she was a busy woman. "'Up at half-past five to bed the last thing at night, working fit to drop. Thirteen years of it, and for reward, grey hairs, frowsy clothes, stooped shoulders, slatternly figure, unending toil in a foul and noisome coffee-house that faced on an alley ten feet between the walls, and a waterside environment that was ugly and sickening, to say the least. You'll be in again to have a look, she questioned wistfully as I went out of the door, and as I turned and looked at her, I realized to the full the deeper truth underlying that very wise old maxim, virtue is its own reward. I went back to her. Have you ever taken a vacation? I asked. Vacation? A trip to the country for a couple of days. Fresh air. A day off. You know, a rest. Lord lummy, she laughed for the first time, stopping from her work. A vacation, eh? For the likes of me. Just fancy now. Mind your feet. This last, sharply, and to me, as I stumbled over the rotten threshold. Down near the West India dock, I came upon a young fellow staring disconsolately at the muddy water. A fireman's cap was pulled down across his eyes, and the fit and sag of his clothes whispered unmistakably of the sea. Hello, mate. I greeted him, sparring for a beginning. Can you tell me the way to Wapping? 
worked your way over on a cattle boat, he countered, fixing my nationality on the instant, and thereupon we entered upon a talk that extended itself to a public house and a couple of pints of half and half. This led to closer intimacy, so that when I brought to light all of a shilling's worth of coppers, ostensibly my all, and put aside sixpence for a bed, and sixpence for more half and half, he generously proposed that we drink up the whole shilling. My mate, he cut up rough last night, he explained, and the bobby's got him, so you can bunk in with me. What you say? I said yes, and by the time we had soaked ourselves in a whole shilling's worth of beer, and slept the night on a miserable bed in a miserable den, I knew him pretty fairly for what he was, and that in one respect he was representative of a large body of the lower-class London workmen my later experience substantiates. He was London-born, his father a fireman and a drinker before him. As a child, his home was the streets and the docks. He had never learnt to read, and had never felt the need for it, a vain and useless accomplishment he held, at least for a man of his station in life. He had had a mother and numerous squalling brothers and sisters, all crammed into a couple of rooms and living on poorer and less regular food than he could ordinarily rustle for himself. In fact, he never went home except at periods when he was unfortunate in procuring his own food, petty pilfering and begging along the streets and docks, a trip or two to sea as mess-boy, a few trips more as coal-trimmer, and then a full-fledged fireman, he had reached the top of his life. And in the course of this he had also hammered out a philosophy of life, an ugly and repulsive philosophy, but withal a very logical and sensible one from his point of view. When I asked him what he lived for, he immediately answered, Booze, a voyage to sea, for a man must live and get the wherewithal and then the paying off, and the big drunk at the end. After that, haphazard little drunks, sponged in the pubs from mates with a few coppers left, like myself, and when sponging was played out, another trip to sea, and a repetition of the beastly cycle. But women, I suggested, when he had finished proclaiming booze the sole end of existence. Women, he thumped his pot upon the bar, and... Arrated eloquently. Women is a thing my education has learnt me to let alone. It don't pay, matey. It don't pay. What's a man like me want a woman, eh? Just you tell me. There was my ma. She was enough. A banging the kids about, and making the old man miserable when he come home, which was seldom, I grant. And for why? Because of ma. She didn't make his home happy, that was why. Then there's the other women. How do they treat a poor stoker with a few shillings in his trousers? A good drunk is what he's got in his pockets, a good long drunk, and the women skin him out of his money so quick he ain't had hardly a glass. I know, I'll have my fling, and I know what's what, and I tell you, where's women is trouble, screeching and carrying on, fighting, cutting, bobbies, magistrates, and a month's hard labour back of it all, and no payday when you come out. But a wife and children, I insisted, a home of your own and all that. Think of it, back from a voyage, little children climbing on your knee, and the wife happy and smiling, and a kiss for you when she lays the table, and a kiss all round from the babies when they go to bed, and the kettle singing, and the long talk afterwards of where you've been, and what you've seen, and of her and all the little happenings at home while you've been away, and— Gone, he cried with a playful shove of his fist on my shoulder. What's your game, eh? A missus kissing, and kids climbing, and kettles singing, all on four pound ten a month when you have a ship, and four nothing when you haven't. I'll tell you what I get on four pound ten. A missus rowing, kids squalling, no coal to make the kettle sing, and the kettle up the spout. That's what I get. Enough to make a bloke blooming well glad to be back to sea. A missus? What for? To make you miserable, kids? Just take my counsel, matey, and don't have em. Look at me. I can have my beer when I like, and no blessed missus and kids are crying for bread. I'm happy I am, with my beer and mates like you, and a good ship coming, and another trip to sea. So I say let's have another pint. Half and half good enough for me. Without going further with the speech of this young fellow of two and twenty, I think I have sufficiently indicated his philosophy of life 
and the underlying economic reason for it. Home life he had never known. The word home aroused nothing but unpleasant associations. In the low wages of his father, and of other men in the same walk in life, he found sufficient reason for branding wife and children as encumbrances and causes of masculine misery. An unconscious hedonist, utterly immoral and materialistic, he sought the greatest possible happiness for himself, and found it in drink. A young sot, a premature wreck, physical inability to do a stoker's work, the gutter of the workhouse, and the end. He saw it all as clearly as I, but it held no terrors for him. From the moment of his birth all the forces of his environment had tended to harden him, and he viewed his wretched, inevitable future with a callousness and unconcern I could not shake. And yet he was not a bad man. He was not inherently vicious and brutal. He had normal mentality and a more than average physique. His eyes were blue and round, shaded by long lashes and wide apart, and there was a laugh in them and a fund of humour behind. The brow and general features were good, the mouth and lips sweet, though already developing a harsh twist. The chin was weak, but not too weak. I have seen men sitting in the high places with weaker. His head was shapely, and so gracefully was it poised upon a perfect neck, that I was not surprised by his body that night when he stripped for bed. I have seen many men strip in gymnasium and training quarters, men of good blood and upbringing, but I have never seen one who stripped to better advantage than this young sot of two and twenty, this young god doomed to rack and ruin in four or five short years, and to pass hence without posterity to receive the splendid heritage it was his to bequeath. It seemed sacrilege to waste such life, and yet I was forced to confess that he was right in not marrying on four pounds ten in London town just as the scene-shifter was happier in making both ends meet in a room shared with two other men than he would have been had he packed a feeble family along with a couple of men into a cheaper room, and failed in making both ends meet. And day by day I became convinced that not only is it unwise, but it is criminal for the people of the abyss to marry. They are the stones by the builder rejected. There is no place for them in the social fabric while all the forces of society drive them downward till they perish. At the bottom of the abyss they are feeble, besotted, and imbecile. If they reproduce, the life is so cheap that perforce it perishes of itself. The work of the world goes on above them, and they do not care to take part in it, nor are they able. Moreover, the work of the world does not need them. There are plenty far fitter than they, clinging to the steep slope above, and struggling frantically to slide no more. In short, the London abyss is a vast shambles. Year by year, and decade after decade, rural England pours in a flood of vigorous strong life that not only does not renew itself, but perishes by the third generation. Competent authorities aver that the London workman whose parents and grandparents were born in London is so remarkable a specimen that he is rarely found. Mr. A. C. Pigou has said that the aged poor and the residuum which compose the submerged tenth constitute seventy-one per cent of the population of London, which is to say that last year and yesterday and today, at this very moment, four hundred and fifty thousand of these creatures are dying miserably at the bottom of the social pit called London. As to how they die, I shall take an instance from this morning's paper. Self-neglect. Yesterday Dr. Wynne Westcott held an inquest at Shoreditch respecting the death of Elizabeth Cruz, aged seventy-seven years, of 32 East Street, Hoban, who died on Wednesday last. Alice Mathieson stated that she was landlady of the house where deceased lived. Witness last saw her alive on the previous Monday. She lived quite alone. Mr. Francis Birch, relieving officer for the Hoban district, stated that deceased had occupied the room in question for thirty-five years. When witness was called on the first, 
he found the old woman in a terrible state, and the ambulance and coachman had to be disinfected after the removal. Dr. Chase Fennell said death was due to blood poisoning from bed sores, due to self-neglect and filthy surroundings, and the jury returned a verdict to that effect. The most startling thing about this little incident of a woman's death is the smug complacency with which the officials looked upon it and rendered judgment that an old woman of seventy-seven years of age should die of self-neglect is the most optimistic way possible of looking at it. It was the old dead woman's fault that she died, and having located the responsibility, society goes contentedly on about its own affairs. Of the submerged tenth, Mr. Pigou has said, either through lack of bodily strength, or of intelligence, or of fibre, or of all three, they are inefficient or unwilling workers, and consequently unable to support themselves. They are often so degraded in intellect as to be incapable of distinguishing their right from their left hand, or of recognising the numbers of their own houses. Their bodies are feeble and without stamina, their affections are warped, and they scarcely know what family life means. For hundred and fifty thousand is a whole lot of people. The young fireman was only one, and it took him some time to say his little say. I should not like to hear them all talk at once. I wonder if God hears them. End of chapter 4